Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me all right? You can all hear me all right, yes? yes? Audience participation, that's good. Hasn't this been an awesome conference? Woo! Awesome, give it up for Pete and uh, everyone else involved in making this happen. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I really enjoyed coming along last year, um, so I'm really excited to speak this time. Thanks to those of you that uh, voted for my talk. It's reassuring to know that at least one person uh, wants to hear what I have to say. Um, so let's see how this goes. Um, so uh, the goal today is I want to give you a bit of an idea of how design happens at GitHub. Um, but just quickly, um, I want to mention that uh, this, uh, I spoke with Pete just before. Um, and because this is the last talk of the day, we're probably not going to do the discussion track. We'll just do like a Q&A session in here after that. Um, so that can go away. Um, so for those of you who haven't met yet, I've met a few of you um, over the past day or so. Um, I'm Kobe Chappell. Um, I go by Kobe's in most places online. Uh, GitHub, Twitter, Instagram, and so forth. Um, this is all being recorded too, obviously. So uh, if you're watching this uh, via video, hello, future people. Um, get, get in touch on, twi on Twitter as well if you have questions. Um, so uh, I'm a designer and developer at GitHub. I'm one of the uh, you know, imposter people I found out yesterday. Um, designery snobby, whatever. That's uh, so uh, who here is GitHub? Yeah? Awesome. Awesome. Um, so for the, anyone who didn't put up their hand or, or if you haven't heard of GitHub before, um, we, GitHub is a tool for people who build software. Um, and we, we help them work better together as a team um, is, the, is the, whole, the whole goal. Um, I work on the web team. Um, and my focus is on product design and, and front-end development. GitHub is based in San Francisco. I live about half an hour south of Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, as you can probably tell by the accent, I'm not from there. I'm from New Zealand, Australia, that side of the world. Um, ask me about that later if you want. Um, so I work remotely. Uh, I'm one of many people who work remotely at GitHub. Um, we have, at any one time, there's usually about uh, between 60 and 70% of the company is remote. So it's quite a lot of people. Um, the reason this number is slightly uh, lower than average is we've just had a, a, a team mini summit at GitHub. So there's a lot of people who are actually in San Francisco at the moment. Um, here's a screenshot from uh, one of the internal apps that we use um, to communicate as a company. It shows where everyone is right now. Um, so as you can see, we're pretty distributed. Um, you'll also notice that there is a, uh, a bug where we have a whole bunch of people just sitting off the coast of Africa there. That's at the coordinate zero, zero. We should probably fix that. <laughs> um, so design, uh, it happens, apparently. Um, design, along with a lot of stuff at GitHub um, that we've done uh, the, whole, the whole time since the company's been here, is uh, we iterate a lot, of, a lot of our internal processes. And design is, is, is one of those things. Um, so a lot has changed as we've grown as a company. Um, a lot will change in the future. Um, but over time, we've got to, uh, got to learn a lot about what works for us, not necessarily what might work, work for other people, but what, what works for us, um, and what doesn't work. Um, so it's far from perfect. Honestly, the, the honest answer of how we do design is that it's kind of messy sometimes, um, sometimes inefficient. Um, but that said, I'm going to try and uh, give you a bit of an insight into the, uh, the principles we've found that have the biggest impact on the end the, the, the quality of the end product that, that you know, we put out there. So this is probably one of the biggest things that happens at GitHub that, that, that uh, di dictates this. Um, most of our design actually happens in code. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, we put a lot of emphasis on hiring designers who can also execute their designs. It's critical at GitHub because uh, designers working on our product need to be able to communicate their ideas in code in order to work with the rest of the, rest of the, the product team. Um, code is the thing that ships. Uh, it focuses feedback on concrete changes and uh, helps to remove a lot of the ambiguity about what people propose if, if they're proposing a change. Uh, especially when you take that code and send a pull request. Pull requests are a collaboration and remote friendly way of uh, reviewing changes. Um, it, lets do the, it lets people do it in their own time uh, and it provides a clear and permanent uh, place for that discussion around a specific set of changes. Uh, there's a lot of benefits from, from having this. Uh, you can uh, take branches and try them out yourself locally. Uh, you can also uh, deploy them, uh, like branch deploy them to production or to a, a staff only uh, environment, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but the end goal of, of this is having a URL that you can share with the team uh, to uh, a live version of your design. Now, the, the pull request isn't obviously a live version of the design, but Having it at a branch means that you can work stuff into your infrastructure that actually makes it possible to share URLs to live versions of your design. 
Uh, in a company like ours, where we have a lot of uh, autonomy uh, uh, throughout the company, it's really easy to get into situations where there's a, a, a potential contention between two hypothetical solutions to a given, to a given problem. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have probably experienced you know, deadlocks like this as well. And what we, use, what we find is that uh, often if someone actually builds one of the options, it'll actually, like even if it's a rough implementation, you can get a lot of new insights by trying out, actually trying out one of the options. You can get a lot of new insights that you couldn't have predicted earlier, and that helps a lot of the time simplify the decision a lot, so it ends up just being an easy decision rather than before it was actually quite contentious. I said before that code is what ships, um, and a corollary of that is that for us, most of, most of the code is being shipped to the browser. So that's where we do a lot of the design. Static design tools, um, obviously things like Photoshop and Sketch, they, uh, using them, it's really easy to ignore things like transitions. Uh, what else did I say? Yeah, interactions, transitions, text rendering, um, as well as a lot of really critical things like the responsiveness of design. And when I say responsiveness, responsiveness I'm not talking about uh, crazily resizing your browser like a mad person. I'm talking about uh, responsiveness in the, in the speed and the performance sense of the word. If those things are terrible, people lose, start to lose trust in your product, and, and that, that, that's not what you want. The reason it's great to do this in the browser is that you get feedback on all of these things all of the time. Um, you're sculpting something real. The analogy I like to use here is that um, it's, like a, it's like a potter working on, on, a, on a piece of pottery on like a, 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 a turntable, like a, a, a wheel. The act of shaping it while the wheel is turning gives you all the feedback you need. When you separate out the design process and do like a two-phase process, that's when you start to run into problems. And the reason you start to run into problems is, is, is things like, for example, with things on the web, having a picture of a website is almost useless because you have to build the whole thing again in code at some point anyway. Designing in the browser means you only have to do it once. Another huge problem with uh, having a two-phase process is that you run into a secondary problem, which is how do you keep the second static version of, of the design up to date with the code version of your design. Uh, you know, it, it is really easy to run into what we call design drift, which uh, is a term that ben, ben used the other day, which I really like. And that's a huge problem, especially on a product like ours that uh, moves really quickly. What we've found is that uh, if, if you're moving away from tools like Photoshop and Sketch as being part of the creative workflow, it can seem like a lot of work to change to doing everything in code. What we found, though, if you pardon the pun, is that once you commit, it actually ends up being a lot faster in the, in, in the overall process. Another thing that's really great um, about designing in the browser is that it, it forces you to focus on the big picture first. Um, things like functionality and, and, and the workflow in general are uh, much easier to focus on. The, the way I like to think about it is getting paint up on the canvas and then pushing it around to, 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 to get it to look right. By putting the raw content in and wiring it up to the workflow as a whole, uh, the things that, uh, that happen before a given screen and after a given screen, it allows you to actually focus first on making sure that whole workflow makes sense, and then you can worry about things like, you know, like button gradients later. Um, the pixel stuff can come much later. Even for a lot of the teams at GitHub who don't work on web product, um, a lot of the design still actually happens in the browser. One thing that's been happening recently is that um, a lot of the teams that work on the native clients, like GitHub for Mac, GitHub for Windows, have actually started doing a lot of the uh, exploratory design in entirely web-based mockups of the application's UI. Uh, so here's an example screenshot. It's literally in the browser. There's like a fake desktop background, and there's like a, a, a window representing the app where we actually build real, U, like real UI. The, this actually uses the exact same image assets that end up being used in Xcode to compile the thing. We've uh, built a lot of uh, custom JavaScript to replicate some of the native functionality. Um, but, and, and there's also some things in there like being able to replicate uh, or si simulate slow or fast network conditions, um, which allow you to actually click around the mock-up and experience what the app would feel like on a slow connection, for example. Another thing about this is that as you click around on, on aspects of the interface, like say you switch to a different repo or you click on another, another commit, um, the URL in the browser actually changes too. So again, this comes back to the idea of being able to share with your team a URL to a live version of your design. 
Over the years, as a designer, um, I've done a lot of design that has involved lorem ipsum text, um, and it's, it's pretty terrible. Um, there's a few things like bacon ipsum or bogan ipsum, I'm not sure if you guys have, uh, have seen that. Um, and those things are an improvement, but only in the fact that they're mildly entertaining. Um, what this boils down to is that it's actually really difficult to do design without real data. And there's a bunch of ways that we, that we try and make, this, make it possible to, to incorporate real data into the design process at GitHub. One of the ways is that we've set up the ability to uh, deploy a branch to one of a few staff-only environments, which I mentioned before. Um, or if you've got something that's ready to ship and you want to verify that it's not going to blow anything up on production, um, we obviously have a lot of CI, but if you want to be absolutely sure, you can deploy it to production and let it sit for a while, watch Twitter in case there's anything, uh, anything goes crazy. Um, and again, the goal here is having uh, shareable URLs to staff-only uh, environments that show real data flowing through, to, flowing through your design. We also have a lot of experiments at GitHub um, which live next to production, sorry, uh, lex, next to production code in master. Um, so, and, and the reason for this is so that we can ex, uh, experience them as part of our daily workflow using the product ourselves. We call that dog fooding, um, and to do that, we create uh, feature flags. Feature flags are essentially Boolean methods that protect our experimental features from, from people who shouldn't see them. Um, I'm sorry to be that douchebag that shows Ruby code at, uh, at a JavaScript conference, but here's a quick example. Um, so essentially, we, we, just, we create a lot of uh, one or two line methods uh, that we can then use elsewhere in the code base to conditionally run different code or show different UI, depending on the user has the, the, the right level of access or not. Um, so, for example, we can delegate it out to other, other methods which do things like check that there's a current user signed in and check to see if they're a member of our, of our staff um, or if they're part of a beta access group or if they're part of the developer program. All these kind of things um, can, be, can be checked elsewhere. We can also add conditions like checking that as well as being um, in, in, in the, a member of staff and having staff mode turned on, which I'll talk, talk about in a second, that you're also a member of a team. So this, this means that we can essentially team ship something rather than just shipping something to the entire staff of GitHub, which would potentially make the whole company really efficient if something went wrong. Um, so this allows us to kind of gradually roll it out to, to, to larger and larger um, populations, if you will. Uh, once we have stuff in, that, that uses these, these flags, what we do is we actually have a staff bar uh, on our website, which um, let, we, can, we can toggle using a keyboard shortcut which allows us to switch staff mode on, on and off. And actually, if something, you know, if we need to swap between the experimental functionality and the um, new functionality, we can do that there and then. It lets us live with our changes and, and, and experience what it's like daily um, and progressively tweak how it works in production. We can also turn it off if we need to show, it, just show, the, show our screen to someone who's not an employee. So then when we do um, progressively make it available, we can go from a team ship to a global staff ship and then uh, when we're finally ready to take it to the rest of the world, we just t take this method and change it to just true, so that the final pull request is literally just a, a single line diff, um, and, and it goes out. So uh, feature flags have a, uh, a real drawback, and that is that it's really easy to lose track of what stuff shipped or not. Um, and, and what happens is that uh, once it's been out for too long, feedback about the old stuff starts getting ignored because it's going away, and feedback about the new functionality stops because you get used to it. So just, there's no other way around this except for, the, for staying vigilant and constantly reviewing what you have out there. Another thing that we've been running into um, over the past year is that uh, dog fooding has its limits. Uh, for example, one of the, some of the ways with it where, where this is evident is in the, like if you want to look at improving the new user experience um, where people are, new, are signing up to GitHub and may, may not know how to code, may not know anything about your product at all, um, we, because we know our product inside out, we are literally not qualified to make assumptions on their behalf. Also, if, uh, f if your customers start becoming a lot larger than you are, or have different business structure internally, or have a lot more policy than you do, like we do with uh, customers who use our, our enterprise and on-premise installs, again, you can't rely on dog fooding to get to the bottom of those problems. Sometimes the only way to get feedback is, is to talk directly to the people using your product. Which brings me to the next point, which is that everything I've talked about so far is basically about trying to get feedback loops out there. You can't do design in a vacuum if you want it to produce results. Um, GitHub's always focused on two main forms of, of, of feedback, dog fooding as well as talking to our, uh, our customers who, who contact us uh, for support. 
They've served us for a long time, but as we've grown, uh, we start, we've, we've realized we need to start adding more feedback mechanisms. So we've been working a lot on building some quantitative stuff into our app that allows us to do things like variance testing, but the main, the main thing we've added recently is uh, the ability to do a lot of uh, user research qualitative studies in, internally. Uh, the goal is basically just to have as many feedback sources as possible and make each feedback loop as tight as possible. One of the things we look for in everyone we hire, not just designers, is taste. It, it, we don't want it to be homogenous across the company, but it's really, it's really critical to us that people can recognize quality and articulate that, or the lack thereof, in, uh, in what they use. Uh, employees who aren't uh, working on code have a lot of great ideas and would be, would be foolish to shut them out. We've also built up a, a style guide, uh, which you can check out at github.com slash style guide. It's actually public, which contains a lot of U common UI components and uh, stuff from JavaScript and visual li libraries that are tested separately. Um, and that means that developers can actually make quite a bit of a head start on the design of a feature before designers actually become involved. And that means that when designer does become involved, they have a huge head start. Another downside of having a ton of people who are capable of thoughtfully articulating the opinion, their opinion is that they frequently do. Um, so when this happens, it's really easy as a designer to feel pressured to comply with every piece of feedback. Um, but the long-term result of that is a product that lacks focus. So it's not a good idea. Um, one way to avoid this is to make sure that the team in general understands that not all feedback will be taken into account and to make sure that the feedback of people who are involved directly in working on that project will uh, carry, a, carry more weight than people who merely have a drive-by opinion. You need to set expectations and then follow up without being an asshole about it if you choose not to address a particular piece of feedback. Everything that we try and do boils down to this. We think design should be an open process. Uh, this applies to development as well, um, like des the design of software in general. Um, and building walls around the design process, what it does is it keeps designers out of contributing elsewhere, like code. And also it also can keep good input from outside, uh, from, from people who aren't designers, out of the creative process. Good design should be everyone's responsibility, and that can only happen when it's an open process. This is what we aim for at GitHub. And if you're looking at ways to improve the way design happens in your company, I, I think you should be thinking about this sort of stuff too. It's, it's not easy though. Uh, doing open design can be really hard. And it, the, the reason it's hard is because it's completely at odds to the way, most, the way most designers have typically worked for a long time. Designers, we often kind of do our work in secret. We, we, we take feedback on something and we go away into our cave and we work on something until we're comfortable with it we bring it out again for more feedback and we repeat. And that's, a, that's closed design. And the, the sad thing is that's how a lot, of, a lot of designers work and they're actually missing out on understanding a lot of the, their own creative process. In order for design to be open, there's a paradigm shift that, that we need to make in, in the way we think about design. We need to start showing our work early. Um, this is a difficult habit to get into, but it, it really pays dividends once you get used to it. It helps keep feedback manageable. It means you don't get huge amounts of, of feedback in one go, um, and it can actually stop you working on a bad idea for, for too long. Often you need that input just to tell you, no, that's a, that's a silly idea. And you're like, oh yeah, so it is. Um, also, if you're proposing multiple, like multiple small, if you're proposing small changes multiple times each day, it keeps the feedback loop really tight, even with a really distributed team. When you, well, another thing is you need to get used to things not being perfect. Um, exploring ideas at non-final levels of fidelity and polish can feel really uncomfortable and feel messy, but it's perfectly normal. You need to seek to show things, especially when it's not perfect, because feedback will always help steer a design towards something better. Sharing work that's still in process, st still in, like a work in progress, um, also helps build empathy. It can be really uncomfortable to put something out there that's, that's not finished yet, but opening up will show your team that you're just human. Um, polished products don't magically start out that way. You have to, you have to go through this, this process. Um, learning to talk through the reasons behind your design, design decisions, whether they're small or big, is also something that, that needs to start happening. Um, sharing your rationale helps people understand what you're factoring in and helps people fill in holes you might have in your thinking. If you don't talk through decisions, if people can't question other people's decisions, then that's a recipe for resentment and a, a really poor quality, quality product. One of the most difficult things to do um, in, in, in life in general is separating yourself from your work. When you love what you do, you invest a lot of personal energy in your work. 
And it's really easy in that, in that case when, when someone gives, gives feedback at, uh, or criticism about your work to misinterpret that as personal criticism. Um, the result is often like emotional knee-jerk reactions and that doesn't help anyone. So a huge part of opening up, your creative, opening up the creative process is trusting that your team isn't questioning you as a person when they question your rationale. This take, takes guts and practice, but it's really worth it. Trust, that, that trust is two-way though. The people giving the feedback need to work hard, often harder, to make sure that their feedback is constructive and that it's focused on the, the, the work in question. Um, and everyone needs to be okay with the possibility that it might not be them that uh, has the best solution. So the upshot is that this, this stuff takes constant work, um, but it's really worth it. It can be kind of messy and efficient some, uh, sometimes, but we've found that the benefits in general outweigh all of the negatives. So um, I, uh, a while back on Twitter, I actually um, asked if people had questions about this. Um, I feel like I've covered a lot of what was asked in this talk. There's probably some stuff I haven't covered. In that case, I, I apologize. But we can, hopefully we can bring some stuff up in the discussion next. Before I do that, though, I just want to quickly remind you guys that uh, not to forget about the GitHub Meetup tonight at HEMA um, at 8 PM tonight. HEMA is just from the roundabout down and to the right. It's a big glass kind of building. I think we're upstairs. Not sure. Um, we've got some snack food coming out and the bar tab as well. So come and join Mike McQuaid, who lives here in Edinburgh, um, Ben Ogle, and myself. And uh, we'd love to meet you. So that's it. That's my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, please get in touch via Twitter. Or if uh, you're not comfortable asking a question in open, uh, email me. Um, thank you. <laughs>